You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. The ability of the Coalition for a Just Cincinnati to successfully press its boycott program was demonstrated twice this past week. First, pressure from the Coalition forced the local NAACP to cancel its scheduled annual Freedom Fund dinner at the downtown Hyatt Regency. When the local chapter balked at changing its plans, the Coalition sent a letter to Kwesi Mafumi, the uh, president of the national NAACP. The letter, signed by Nathaniel Livingston, Jr., charged that by holding its dinner in the downtown location, the NAACP will, quote, be helping to undermine the hard work that has gone into moving the city toward ending the status quo, which has existed for so long, and will be endorsing the city's continued oppression of the poor and African-American citizens and abdicating the NAACP's longstanding claim to the high moral ground. Then on Thursday, City Manager Valerie Lemmy addressed the Greater Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce. She told business leaders that citizens are speaking to us through boycotts, lawsuits, and talk radio. We may not like what they have to say, Lemmy said, but we have a moral and legal obligation to listen and to act. Before we can act, we must understand the depth and breadth of their frustration. This morning, I am joined by two of the leaders of the Coalition for a Just Cincinnati one of the groups spearheading the boycott effort. Nathaniel Livingston, Jr. has been an activist in the city for some time and ran for city council last year. Amanda Mays is also one of the leaders of the Coalition for a Just Cincinnati. Nice to and Nate, welcome back to uh, Newsmakers. Amanda, Good welcome morning. to Newsmakers. Thanks for having um, me. Let's, let's start right with the, what happened Thursday uh, with the city manager talking to the business leaders. What's your reaction to that? Well, I'm, I'm happy. I'm impressed by her statements uh, to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think those statements are long overdue. There's been a reluctance by city officials to properly uh, address the boycott and the boycott demands. And so I hope that this does set a tone for some ongoing negotiations. Uh, we hope that we can, by her comments, set the tone for the, in the beginning of the end of the boycott. Which is what we, which is what we all want. Uh, Amanda, has there been up till this point any direct contact between your organization and the city manager? Has, has, have you been able to talk with her quietly behind the scenes before this? No, absolutely not. And we wouldn't talk quietly behind the scenes with the city manager or any other city official. Anything that we do would be open, and that's why you know we appreciate her statements that much more. Um, because they seem to be um, genuine and they're totally appropriate. Okay. Uh, Nate, back on the, the discussion, and we'll, we'll come to what it is that needs to be discussed in, in that in a minute, but on the whole debate over uh, the holding of the NAACP dinner downtown, one of the statements you made, and I don't know if I have the exact quote, but you can correct me if I've got it a little bit wrong, okay. um, is that if the NAACP went ahead with its dinners downtown, they would be aiding, and this wasn't in print, or at least I didn't see it in print, it, they would be aiding your enemies. Yes. Who are your enemies? Well, and, and I think what it said was they would be aiding the enemies of change. And our, it, the, it, the people who have fought against change in Cincinnati. Who are those people? Are Mayor Charlie Lucan, the members of Cincinnati City Council, and some members of the Cincinnati business community. For example, specifics. For example, uh, while we appreciate Valerie Lemmy's words on Thursday, we would much more appreciate her uh, making the city come forward with the $208 million that they promised to the Empowerment Zone, and we would appreciate the business community coming up with the almost $2 billion, I'm sorry, $2.2 .2 billion that they promised to the Empowerment Zone. Anyone who stands in the way of aiding the poor and the African-American communities, I believe, is an enemy of change. So those are the people. If this discussion is to be opened up now, as the city manager has suggested, and maybe, and maybe in a new way, as you're suggesting, who needs to be at the table? Who needs to be involved in that discussion, Amanda? That would be, that would be the mayor, obviously, um, county members from the county commissioner's office, city council members. Um, 
members of the CBC, and then obviously um, members from civil rights organizations such as the Coalition for Just Cincinnati and Cincinnati Black United Front would be there to maintain a balance. Would the NAACP be there? Are they an organization that you want at the table? We've set up, we've set up uh, a negotiations document, and in that negotiations document, there is room for members of the NAACP to be there to help facilitate change. Um, it really depends on your area of expertise. Um, for instance, uh, Dr. Brodnax has got extensive background and expertise. Dr. Stanley Brodnax. That's absolutely correct. In, in the economic field and economic injustice. And so while he may not necessarily be a member of the coalition, he would be welcome. And if the NAACP has members like that as well who have an area of expertise and who can really help in the four specific areas that we have, which is civil and human We're rights. We're going to talk about those areas in right, just a minute. Then they would be welcome. Okay. So uh, anybody else that you would want at the table, Nick? No, I think she, I think she laid it okay. out. Let's take a look at some of the specifics because one of the questions that has been said is that the you know what is it that can be done that would ever have the boycott called off or is this a moving target are there specifics that could actually be accomplished so let's take a look and I would recommend to people uh, on the you have a website that's right and people can take a look at uh, the section on demands and uh, look for themselves about what it is that's there so uh, we're not we're only gonna have time to take a look at some of these things let's talk you got four basic categories let's talk about them in order if, if that's okay with you uh, and social and an economic apartheid now that one of the main sections of that deals with the empowerment zones that's right the funding of the empowerment zones without getting into a complicated discussion has any progress been made on that yet no Okay, so from the time that the demands were put on, because on some cases, things that are on that website, there has been movement on, in some areas, but on the empowerment zone, no. No. And, and, and if we could, without getting into a complicated discussion, right. explain to people what the empowerment zone is. Okay, go the, ahead. The city of Cincinnati has, uh, the, they aided nine neighborhoods. Um, without saying them all, they're Mount Auburn, Avondale, Evanston, Over the Rhine, the West End, uh, Clifton, Clifton uh, Upper Clifton, um, and there are nine, nine of these neighborhoods that the city admitted had been historically neglected when it comes to economics. They made application to the federal government, and the city promised that if the federal government would give them $100 million over 10 years, that they would put in $208 million. Along with their application, they went and solicited promises from some of Cincinnati's largest uh, business corporations. Um, Procter and Gamble, Synergy, Fifth Third Bank, and they promised a commit. They made a commitment of about 2.2 billion dollars over 10 years. And again, to your question of whether or not they have have done what they said, the answer is just a flat no. Uh, the city has has fought tooth and nail to to redefine the terms of the agreement. Do those numbers get changed at all because of the time that the commitment was made was in economic growth and the time that we're now in is an economic recession? Uh, is there any compromise on the numbers? No, no. Okay, so the numbers have to be fulfilled? Yes. On both sides, okay. Uh, one of the uh, things that w was said in the demands is a more diversified workforce Yes. Uh, and also uh, more diversity in suppliers, you know, black, support of black or minority businesses. One of the responses of Michael Fisher, the head of the Greater Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce, to Valerie Lemmy's points yesterday was, and I suspect it was directly in response to the demands of the boycott, was that there is progress being made on that, that the corporations in Cincinnati are changing. Do you see any concrete development and improvement in that area? No, I don't. And it, you know, that's a typical statement. You know, change is coming. We've heard that for 50 years. Well, then, how how would you measure that change? How how would how would the corporate community, the business community, demonstrate that that change has actually happened? See, and I think measuring that change and and 
would be something that you could do in the negotiations process to set up a way where we can have accountability and which is what we lack right now which is part of what negotiations is all about is it makes a way to measure change and assure change and make somebody accountable for that change. Would that probably be in terms of the percentage of employees by various corporations in Cincinnati that are African American? Would changing those percentages? How would that, even if we don't know the numbers, how would we measure that? Well, yeah, you, first you look at the, the percentage of, of employees. Then you look at specifically the percentage of management employees, because we don't want just all African Americans to be in low paying jobs. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at some of the large contracts, which is what, what I would say to Mr. Fisher, if these things are true, show us the numbers on Fort Washington Way. Show us the numbers on the Cincinnati Bank, Paul Brown Stadium. Show us the well, numbers. Well, we all know that Paul Brown Stadium didn't happen. Exactly. And we know that, I don't know about Fort Washington Way, the specifics, but the claim is that the baseball stadium is different. The claim is that the Freedom Center, which isn't a public project, but it's a not-for-profit project, is different. Uh, are those and, fair and, targets at this sure, point? Sure, sure. And, and one of the biggest projects that we have on the sort of on the shelf is the development of the banks project. And there have been large cries from African American contractors that they've been locked out of that process. And so we have to take a, a, a broad look at all of these major projects that are going into Cincinnati. Do you, see any pro and, do you see any difference between the Reds, the contracting process and the Reds, new Red Stadium versus the Bengal Stadium? There, there is minimal change, but it's just like with this proposed okay. money for Cincinnati Public Schools. When we go look at where the contracts have historically been, we see that African Americans are, for the most part, locked out of the process. Okay. Uh, I'm aware of time, so I want to keep moving. Okay. Uh, a second area is restore public accountability to the police. Yes. Now, there is the collaborative agreement. There is also rolled into that, or that's rolled into the agreement with the... Justice Department, uh, where do you think we have stu we stand on progress or move? Let's just put it this way, neutral term, movement in this area. We I don't think we've seen any improvement in police policing in police community relations. It may be too early to tell, um, but I think one of the main things that that the collaborative agreement didn't address was um, accountability and I think that's that's the main issue. Isn't there a new police review board and process that has much more teeth than I the old one? See and I don't agree I don't think that th this review board does have much more teeth I think it's too linked with the city um, I don't think that anybody has to answer to the new citizens complaint authority who do they have authority over is the question who has to do, who has to act upon their recommendations? And those questions remain unanswered. It doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Isn't the, the change there that now the federal courts have continuing supervision uh, through a master and then ultimately through the judge? And when you talk about accountability, what you've brought in on a continuing basis is the courts. Isn't that different? Yeah, but see, there's a go-between. Um, and that go-between is the monitor. The monitor oversees the process, and if the monitor sees a problem, they go to the judge. But the monitor is somebody who is an ex, um, an ex police officer or an ex prosecutor or somebody who I believe would probably very likely have bias. So, and so if the monitor is not picked carefully, you know, the accountability with What type of person do you want to see as monitor? Because that monitor hasn't been chosen yet. Right. I, I would actually like to see, um, I would like to see somebody from outside of the city, and I would like for that person to be... Um, what if that person was from outside the city but a former police officer? See, and that, that type of person would have an obvious bias. So there would be no, that would not be acceptable? That's absolutely correct. A uh, former uh, a prosecutor? That, that person would have bias. Okay. So you want somebody who has no experience in the police and justice system? I think that I want somebody who is aware of the issues and who would not have a, a natural prejudice because of past experience. Okay. Um, moving along here. Uh, <laughs> this third area is support and enforce civil rights, uh, civil and human rights. Right. Um, 
also the some of the Justice Department issues are involved in this particular area and I again recommend that people go read these for themselves one of the things there is repeal issue three which deals with uh, you know the, the, the it was a issue that forbade the city from uh, passing any laws protecting gay and lesbians is now that's something that the citizens have to do government can't j officials business officials can't change that themselves what happens on a case like this if citizens don't change it this could come back up on there are people working to get this back on the ballot what if it goes down what if it ends up being same same as it always or it is right now what happens to the boycott is this a demand that has to happen for the boycott to end well well the, actually this section is the, the section that I personally am most proud of okay our, our demand that the city enforce civil and human rights and I'm proud to, to stand uh, with groups like Stonewall that have been fighting to get issue three repealed for a, a number of years. Right. Um, it is targeted at Cincinnatians. That's one of the few demands that isn't targeted at city government or county government or, or but somebody what happens in the business community. If, if this gets back on the ballot, and I've been very aware of the groups trying to get it back on the ballot, and the reversal is not approved, what happens to the boycott? Well, we don't we don't I don't want a misinterpretation of that demand. You know, um, they're asking for the repeal of issue three. Now, whether or not that means putting it back on the ballot is another question. I, re I believe issue three is unconstitutional. Yeah, but the courts have already put that aside. So the point is, I, I'm, all, I'm all I'm trying to clarify is demands versus negotiables. So if this, isn't ex if this change isn't adopted by the voters, can the boycott end? I think there are higher courts that can determine whether or not that's constitutional. Well, but but it's as not for, in the Supreme Court. As as far as our demand is concerned, w number one, we don't want to negotiate down our demands uh, in public on on TV <laughs> programs. But but I think I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. But I think that the coalition would be satisfied if it is put to a vote. Uh, that I believe that is the essence of our demand. So and that what people we're have another chance at it. Right, and what okay. we're saying to Cincinnati is that I we believe I am already this is over time, so I'm very aware okay. of this. Let me just ask one final question. What has to happen in order for the boycott to end or be modified? Our demands have to be met. We've, we've set out a process. It's also on our website, cincyboycott.org. Uh, we believe we've set out a process. We want to sit down with the people who can affect change and, and negotiate these demands. Now that Valerie Lemmy has said what she said, will you call her today? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. We'll have Thanks you for. back. This isn't going away quick. Several months ago, the boycott, uh, pardon me, uh, stay tuned. After the break, uh, we're going to have the, uh, some representatives of the Education Summit 2002 as our guests. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Frequently we treat education here on Newsmakers from a structural perspective. Policies, tax levies, bond issues, and trends and test scores. But for students and parents, education is an intensely personal experience. It is in that spirit that the Greater Cincinnati Urban League is sponsoring Education Summit on September the 12th at the Cintas Center on the campus of Xavier University. I am now joined by two of the people organizing the Education Summit. Steve Dobbins is the chair of the summit, and the committee for the Urban League that's putting this together, and Rochelle Morton is the vice president for education and youth development for the Greater Cincinnati Urban League. Steve, Rochelle, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Hi, Steve, thank what's you. really the goal here? What, what, what are you trying to accomplish with the Education Summit? Well, the Education Summit is, is designed to improve the academic and social wellness of our youth in the greater Cincinnati community. Uh, we're bringing together uh, 2,000 people, at least 1,000 uh, youth and 1,000 uh, parents, uh, uh, friends and sponsors and, uh, and folks like that to CentOS Center on September 12th. And, and Rochelle, who should think of, you know, you're, we're talking, Steve was mentioning numbers, but mm -hmm. who should think about attending this? What, what age groups, what you know, students, parents, what, who should be there? Okay, the target age group is actually the students who are in grades 7 through 12. But okay, anyone, so junior high and high school. Yeah, junior high and high school. But anyone who cares about education and about the future of our youth needs to be there. 
Okay. So that's parents, that's community leaders, politicians, educators, people from all walks of life. But is the program mostly directed at those students and their parents? Yes, our primary focus for the Education Summit is to zero in on the students who need that, and that's, and that's really the whole premise behind the Education Summit. But of course, for kids to be successful, it's, it's proven that the parental involvement and adult involvement in their lives makes them much more successful. You know, I, I, I want to talk about the headliners because everybody will recognize <laughs> the names, but let's talk about what will happen besides the headliners before we get to those people. Uh, what will those students and their parents actually do during that day? What are some of the examples? Uh, you can't describe all of them, but what are some of these things that they will do? Okay, well, the day will actually start off. We'll have an opening session, which will last about 15 or 20 minutes, and that will be kicked off by Coach Mike Martin and Dante Shackelford, who was one of our speakers last year. He's a young man out of Dayton. He's a junior in high school, but he is an outstanding speaker. They will kick the day off and get the kids motivated and inspired, and then from that point, they will move into uh, workshops. There will be three workshops that we will have for the youth, as well as a Knowledge is Power fair that will take place. But there are actually five different workshops that are going to take place. What are some course. of the workshops? That well, the some committee? of the workshops that we're going to have, and I have them listed here, and we'll just go over them. Hip-hop and education. And basically, hip-hop is a naturally a slang that kids use. But with that slang, they have to purchase, they purchase clothes. So it's 75% it's off a pair of jeans, 10% off of uh, a pair of gym shoes. What's that relationship? What color is smart? Regardless if you're brown, yellow, green, you're an intelligent person. So it doesn't make a difference what color you are. You can be very intelligent. Cash English, that's all about money. We know what that's about. That's about how you spend your money and a relationship. Teacher-student relationship, naturally, is the children's or the youth's respect perspective with their teachers. ABCs of leadership, and that's leadership. That's all about leadership. Will, will in these sessions, in these workshops, will this be people talking at the students and the parents, or will the students and the parents have any input in the, what, what will be the dynamics inside those workshops? Actually, the workshop presenters that we're bringing in, we have asked that their presentation be very interactive with the youth. We don't want them to just go in there and just just talk or do a big speech to the youth. We want them to go in there and whatever they talk about, we want the youth to be involved in that talk. Okay. As well as the parents, there are adult workshops in the afternoon. So we have our youth workshops in the morning, but we have adult workshops in the afternoon. But the good thing about both workshops, the same speakers that the youth will be hearing, then when we come back in the afternoon, the adults will be hearing those same, those same workshop presenters as well as those same topics. You, could, you mentioned Mike Martin, who I think of as a headliner, <laughs> but um, uh, you've also got Anthony Munoz. Yes. And, but in the evening, you've got a, a, a very big speaker. Let's talk about him a little bit. Well, we have Malik Yoba, <laughs> New York <laughs> Undercover. Everyone knows who this guy is. Uh, he's going to be our keynote speaker in the, in the evening. And he's going to talk about education. He is a youth advocate, and he's a dynamic person. Okay. And what do you, uh, these, these headline speakers, are they to get people energized? Is that their main role, or are they communicating information? Actually, it's both. They're to get people energized, but they have a message to carry. And as with Malik, when he addresses the, the audience in the evening, he's going to talk about the the whole premise that achievement does matter and address some of the disparities in education. So we want them to get them energetic, but we have a, a clear message that we want to carry. You know, one of the things I noticed on his bio is uh, a, a new project called the Fatherhood Project. Do you know anything about that? What? Uh, that's an initiative that Malik started last year. Actually, Malik Yoba is a, is a new father himself. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, Malik uh, just had a new baby. and. He believes that the father plays should play a, a major part in a child's life. So um, he's out there. Um, he goes from school to school. He talks about his story. He shares his life, and and tells and likes you to know where what point he came from. So we're we're going to be excited about hearing a little bit about how he got to where he got in his life and sharing that as well as carrying that message about achievement. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure that people have a chance to take a look at the details of the information here. And let's, let's put up, this is the Education Summit 2002, September the 12th, which is a Saturday. Is that correct? Yes. It's no, at the, September the 12th is a Thursday. Thursday, Thursday I'm sorry. Uh, at Sintai Center at XU from 9.30 a.m. until 8.30 in the evening. If you want more information, 
call 281-9955 or check the Greater Cincinnati uh, Urban League website at gcul.org. Thank you very much and good luck on the uh, education summit. I'm sure we'll be there. We'll see how that turns out. Okay. Thank you, thank Dan. You. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. We're going to be off the next two Sundays for special events, but we'll join you again in mid-September. Have a good week.